The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me to the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. If you're like me and tend to leave a marker, a post-it note, or last week's bulletin in your Bible where we were, you'll find it right there in chapter 14 of Matthew, beginning verse 22, we'll read through verse 33. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far away from the shore, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, we pray as we hear these words from Holy Scripture that you give us ears to hear. Ears that hear what you would have us to hear. Words that would transform us, change us, call us even out onto the tumultuous sea. Help us to hear your words, God, while whatever words I put in the way are quickly forgotten. May we hear your words. May they change us. More and more into the likeness of your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. I remember, I remember quite well the first time I met him. I was a new transfer student at Samford. I wanted to be a part of a program called Samford Sunday. You've heard me talk about that program before. It used to be called H-Day back when Samford was Howard College. It was a program for students to be able to preach in Baptist churches all over Alabama on most Sundays during the semester. In order to be a part of Samford Sunday way back then when I was in college, you know, way, way back. I'm not, I'm not that old. I'm trying to be funny. Um, Way back then, you had to have a one-on-one, sit-down, face-to-face interview with him. And I can remember, I can remember an awful lot about that first meeting with a man who would come to quietly define a great deal of my love for Samford, particularly the religion department, a love for my calling. We sat in a classroom across the hall from the university minister's office, a classroom normally used by underclass students. So instead of sort of seminar style tables, it had rows of what they call in college desks. And I say they call these things desks in college because when you're in elementary school, you sit at a desk and it's big enough to put your textbooks, your lunchbox, uh, a pencil box, you know, your dog, whatever else you need. And by the time you get to college, it's little more than a glorified chair with like a canoe oar on the side. But I sat in one of those chairs, one of those desks, and he sat in the other one. We talked about preaching. We talked about ministry. We talked about our mutual upbringing, our mutual home in the wiregrass in the deep parts of South Alabama. And then he prayed with me. 
or rather for me and my calling. His name is Sigurd Bryan. And if you know someone else named Sigurd, uh, that'd be two people I know. To many of you here, he would remind you an awful lot of Oliver Graves. In fact, I saw a lot of Sigurd in Oliver. Sigurd and his wife Sarah are about as close to saints as I've ever met. I had the privilege my whole time at Samford to know Dr. Bryan. And even, even had the privilege to worship with he and Sarah when I was an intern at Shadescrest Baptist Church. In fact, two years later, when I was ordained at Shadescrest, Sarah was the chair of deacons. So in my office, on my ordination certificate, next to the pastor's signature, is the signature, and I love that she wrote, Mrs. Sarah Bryan. Just in case they, someone thought it was a man named Sarah. <laughs> we lovingly referred to Dr. Bryan in the religion department as St. Sigurd due to his quiet demeanor and saint-like life. In fact, we heard all sorts of legends about St. Sigurd. While others in the religion department had rumors that suggested they had set Bibles on fire or denounced the divinity of Jesus, Dr. Bryan was rumored to have done something entirely different. You see, he was retired when I met him, but still every morning, Dr. Bryan would drive to Sanford and swim in the pool on campus. And as the story goes, Dr. Bryan swam every morning 99 laps. He would come down and swim back and forth one lap 99 times. The first time I heard that, I said, why does he only swim 99 laps? Why not just make 100? They said, oh, well, after the 99th lap, he gets out of the water and walks across the pool <laughs> for the hundreds. <clears throat> Some of you know people, I'm sure, like that, right? I'm sure Dr. Bryan would not like that story, nor does he probably like that we call him St. Sigurd, mostly because he's just a little too humble for his own good. But isn't that a mark of, of deep faith and saint-likeness, right? It's made its way into our common vernacular. If someone is, is amazing, if they can accomplish great things, we say they can what? Walk on water. It's one of the more readily recognizable stories and attributes of Jesus' miraculous nature. And most of us who've heard the story in church, we also know it's not just Jesus that walks on the water, but it's Peter. Peter walks on the water too, at least for a little while, more than I ever would. Yes, Peter walks out on the water towards Jesus. And as long as I've heard this story, we've touted that as a sign of Peter's great faith of his trust in Jesus' power to keep his feet just above the water. Of course, you know, the story goes on to say, but when Peter noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. It's usually here uh, when we say something like, well, Peter took his eyes off Jesus and began to sink down. So if you just keep your eyes on Jesus... Now, that's not a bad sentiment. Really, it's not. To keep one's eyes fixed on Jesus, to keep one's uh, focus of life buried on Jesus. But the scripture doesn't say anything about Peter and Jesus being locked in some sort of divine staring contest and Peter blinked first. It doesn't say that. It says a lot of other stuff. If I'm honest with you, the more I read this text, the more I read the story, the more questions I have about it. The more Peter's actions make less sense to me. I mean, we know the gist of the story. Jesus has fed thousands of people. He's tired. He's just heard John died. We saw that last week. He's fed thousands of people. The disciples have helped. He's tired. He was going by himself to pray. He was interrupted. And so he sends the disciples, tells them, y'all go get in a boat, leave me alone. I'm going up the mountain to pray. I'll meet you on the other side. And as they go across the lake, while Jesus is praying, a storm, as it so often does in that part of the world, begins to just show up. And all through the night, it thrashes the disciples' boats. And then, then sometime in the early morning, that time in the morning where it's probably not legal to shoot the deer, but you can be in the deer stand, you know what I'm talking about? That time of morning, when it's still dark, and you can just sort of make out stuff, Jesus comes to them walking out on the water. 
They've been out on this boat all night, rocked, thrashed back and forth, worried they're going to die, trying to keep each other afloat and awake. So I think they have a rather natural reaction to seeing a human figure walking out on the water. It's a ghost, right? It's a ghost. What else would it be? But immediately, Jesus speaks up, says to them, take heart. The King James says, be of good cheer. We read that in Sunday school. I thought that was, always makes me think of Christmas. Be of good cheer. Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. Now, it's right here where I think the story actually gets a bit weird, if I'm honest with you. See, if it just went from verse 27 right to verse 32, then it might make a little more sense. After the disciples see Jesus, after Jesus says, take heart, it's I, don't be afraid. If Jesus would then just get in the boat. Get in the boat, the wind ceases, and they all worship him. That's still a good story. It's it's reminiscent of the story in Matthew chapter 8, when Jesus calms the storm. But that's not the way the story goes. No, Jesus tells the disciples to take heart, don't be afraid. The ghost they see is in fact him. But instead of them just sort of breathing this collective sigh of relief, instead of Jesus saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid, and they go... Whew, good. The one who calmed the storm will calm it again. They don't do that. Instead, Peter, Peter pipes up. He always does. I wonder if in his lifetime, if Peter had gotten to read the, read the Gospels, if he had said, you know, sometimes that was Timothy. Sometimes that was Matthew. Sometimes that was Bartholomew. Sometimes it was Judas. It was Judas when it was really bad. But it's always Peter. Peter pipes up, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, we've heard that so often, we don't see what's weird about it. But hear it again. If it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Who else would it be? Really, had Peter known of somebody while he was out fishing his whole life, of someone who could walk on the water? Who else would it be? If it's you... I don't know if it's you. Who in the world would Peter have thought it could be? Maybe he still thought it was a ghost. But who else would have walked out on that water, told them, do not be afraid, it's I. And Jesus, uh, Peter knows instinctively. Jesus doesn't say, it's me, Jesus of Nazareth, Joseph, Mary, you know, I hear my brothers giving you some identification. No, it's I. Who else would have done that? But Jesus. And still Peter says, if it is you. And furthermore, why why does Peter, why does Peter want Jesus to command him to come out on the water? That's a bit odd, isn't it? I don't think I'd have asked that. If I'd have been in a boat, rocked by the waves, rocked in a storm, and I saw a ghost and found out it's Jesus, I don't think I'd have said, oh, hey, let me come out there. I think you know what I would have said. It makes more sense to me. Maybe I I think differently than most folks. I would have said, hey, well, since you're here, could you quit all this? We're scared. Been out here all night, tired, hungry. You've been over there praying on the mountain. Could you quit all this? That's what I would have said. But not Peter. Lord, if it is you, let me come out there to you. Sure, I, I suppose Peter may have wanted to be where Jesus was. That's a nice little way to talk about it. But Jesus was walking towards them. Now, other, other stories, other gospel versions of this story says Jesus was trying to sort of sneak around them. Uh, maybe he was fed up with them. I don't know. But here, Matthew says he was walking towards them, presumably to get on the boat with them. So why does Peter want to go out there? And what was Peter going to do when he got there? I wonder about this. What if Peter hadn't sank? What was he going to do? Uh, hey, Jesus, like, what's he going to do? Is he going to holler back at the boat? Y'all go on ahead. Me and Jesus are going to walk the rest of the way. What's he going to do? Was he going to just walk out there and make sure you get a better look at Jesus? The other disciples, what we seem to say, they don't have any faith, but, but they seem to be really content with knowing it's Jesus coming towards them. That the one who calmed the storm before was close by. No reason to get out of the boat. We're here in the midst of the storm once again. But Jesus has done it before. But Peter wants something else. It seems like Peter wants something more. But what exactly? 
I think that's where those verses in between, the verses that make it an odd story, come in. Verse 28, Peter answers Jesus, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out on the water. And Jesus says a word that's actually reminiscent to the call to discipleship. He says, come. And so Peter, we're told, got out of the boat, started walking on the water. I don't know what that looked like. I don't know if he floated six inches above, maybe got his toes wet, got the hem of his, I don't know. But he started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. Now, up to this point, everything's going well. Peter gets the response he'd hoped for. Maybe, or maybe he, he hoped it wasn't Jesus, right? You ever do that sometimes? Lord, is that you? Nope, wasn't the Lord. Okay, we're, we're not going to do that. Maybe. But he gets a response, and so he steps out of the boat and starts walking on the water. Now, I don't know if this is a sign of Peter's faith, of Jesus' power, both. Or a sign of something altogether different. But I know it didn't last long. Because when, when Peter noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Look again at that text, what it says. We all heard the story, but look again. Don't let it go by you. When he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. Where was he at like an hour before this? Did he not notice the strong wind before he got out of the boat? Had Peter been aloof, unaware of the great wind and waves that had battered the boat? The wind that Matthew says was so obviously against them. Does Peter not know about this? So why, why all of a sudden does it seem that Peter notices the strong wind and becomes frightened? Why all of a sudden? He knows it's there. Why does Matthew tell us when he noticed it now, he becomes frightened? Could it be, could it be that when Peter got out of the boat and started walking towards Jesus, that he thought the wind would stop? Could it be that when Peter got out of the boat and started walking towards Jesus, that he thought the waves would cease to rise? that the water would calm to a glass-like surface and it'd be a cakewalk out to Jesus. That he'd walk safely and freely out to Jesus. Could it be that Peter thought getting closer to Jesus was the safer path, the more secure approach to take when one is being battered by the waves to get closer to Jesus? Did Peter give in to the notion that so many of us fall prey to? That getting closer to Jesus is safe without any chance of harm or hardship. Because isn't that what we're so often prone to think, to believe? That if we just get closer to Jesus, the waves will settle down, the winds will cease. And the storms will blow over. Isn't that what we want to believe? That if we have enough faith, if we get out of the boat, if we set foot on the water, Jesus will make all the danger disappear. And we'll be safe and out of harm's way. Isn't that what we want? It's what I want. But is that what Jesus gives us? This morning... I can't help but wonder about those Christians, those clergy and laypersons alike who, who met at St. Paul's Memorial Church in Charlottesville this weekend. I can't help but wonder if they believe that, that Jesus would make the danger disappear, that their faith would keep them safe and out of harm's way. I wonder, do you think that they, when they took those first steps on to the tumultuous waters of racism and hatred, that they believed that they'd be stilled as soon as they started walking. That because they were close to Jesus, the danger would disappear. 
Or what about those believers who, who answer the call of Christ to go to those places in the dark corners of this world where war and violence have left the land scarred and broken? Places where so often the gospel of Jesus is not allowed, outlawed, or hated. Do you suppose that these people believe that the bombs will stop and the guns won't shoot? And that folks will listen with open minds and open ears if they just walk a little closer themselves to Jesus. Or maybe, maybe you've been in some place in your own life where you wanted to believe that if you just prayed a little bit more, just read your Bible a little bit more, just went to one more church service, just did one more thing, just had the courage to step out of the boat, that life would suddenly become a gravy train with biscuit wheels. That if you just got a little bit closer to Jesus, everything would be gone. It would all be sunshine and cake and ice cream and dancing wonder if we think if we get a little closer to Jesus, everything will be all right. Have you ever thought that before? Because I know I have. Like Peter, though, when I've been there, when I think I've found the answer, when I think peace will come and things will get better because I'm taking a step out, when I'm taking a risk to go towards Jesus, Eventually, I realize that things don't always get better. In fact, I often realize that the closer I get to Jesus, the more tumultuous the waves get. The stronger the wind blows, the deeper the sea seems. I found that the more that I pursue Jesus, the more complicated my life gets. The closer I try to get to Jesus, it's odd, the more stuff I seem to care about the more aware I am of others in the world and others down the street. The more aware I am of my own implications and the brokenness and sorrow in this world. But the closer I get to Jesus, the less still the waters seem to get. I have found that the more I pursue Christ, the more complicated things are the more nuanced my convictions become, the more my beliefs get tossed about on the waves, they get disoriented, they get recast. And the more risks I take in getting closer to Jesus, the more I realize how easy it is to be overwhelmed by it all. To be overwhelmed by all of a sudden caring about all these things. And I realize... That all the easy cookie cutter answers and bumper sticker slogans of cultural Christianity won't still the sea. It won't quiet the thunder. And it won't calm the storm. Now what I've come to learn, like Peter, is that the closer I try to get to Jesus, the more I notice the wind and the waves, and the more likely I am to be overcome by them. And the more likely I am to cry out, Lord! Save me. And I know. I know when I am overcome by the cruelty, the selfishness, the inhumanity, the wickedness, hatred and sin present not only in this world, but in my own heart. When I am overcome by these things, I know. When I am overcome by all of this and feel as if the waters of this life are about to overtake me. Every single time, Jesus reaches out his hand, pulls me up, and says, You of little faith, why did you doubt? And in spite of my lack of faith, in spite of my doubt, Jesus will always be there. Jesus will always catch me. He may not still the storm. He may not calm the sea. He may not make everything better. But he will always catch me. He will always catch you. Jesus will always be there. Whether we sink or walk. And thanks be to God that he is. Would you pray with me?
Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us, O Lord. In those times when we try to get closer, when our heart longs for more of you, and yet still we are overcome, overwhelmed by what you have for us. God, help us to see that you are always there, always there to catch us. Even when our faith is lacking, even when our doubts seem so high, Lord, that you are there to catch us, to pull us out of the water, to walk with us. So, Lord, whatever winds may be raging in our own lives this morning, whatever storms may have us tossed and torn. Lord, speak to us this morning. Remind us that you are always there. Always there to catch us. Whether we sink, whether we walk, or Lord, whether we just can't go on anymore. Be with us now, Lord Jesus. Catch us and call us further out into the water. In your name we pray. Amen.